Today we're going to talk about the format and style of technical committee documents. There's a lot that could be covered in this webinar, and what we're going to do is just kind of go over briefly some of the big things that come up, one being the roster. That's a common question we get, which roster to use. Another then is just going to be the general layout of the document. So kind of how you set up a code, you know, what's the order of chapters, how do you set up a specification and guides and reports. And then we'll just talk a little about the references. Since these are topics where you could probably spend a half an hour to an hour on how to write a code, how to write a specification, how to write guides and reports, this is just kind of an overview. At the very end, I'll show you where things are in the TCM, so you can kind of familiarize yourself with it. The 2014 TCM should be on the website in a couple weeks before convention. You will get a copy of the TCM at the spring convention at the chair breakfast. And they're really, the things we're going over today, nothing's changed, so you should be all set. The first thing we're going to talk about is the roster. And who is listed on the roster? We get this question a lot, and I can see where it comes up. You start a document, you submit it for TAC review, two years later it goes to the printer. Your committee membership has changed, but your roster still reflects that two-TAC draft. That is correct. It is supposed to do that because all voting members on the main committee and subcommittees and the consulting members at the time of the opening date of a document, sorry, last letter ballot before submission for TAC review is listed on the roster. Associate members are not listed. So you'll need to, if you have subcommittee members, since they are listed, a lot of people have active subcommittees. Sometimes people are coming to us and saying, I don't know who these people are, these subcommittee members. I don't know who this consulting member is. Make sure your roster is active and that you know who your subcommittee members are. If there are people on there that you don't know, never show up because they should all be voting members of the subcommittee, take them off. You know, maybe you have subcommittees you didn't realize you had. Kind of uh, look for that. And consulting members are those who are someone who's maybe been a longtime member of the committee or they have a special expertise. You should know who they are. So this way we don't have people just getting their names on the roster that no one knows about. Uh, if you have questions regarding committee membership, you can contact Kelly Dudley or Kim Olesky. And they'd be happy to help you. Okay, the next question we get is, can I have an acknowledgement on the roster? And the answer is, yes, yeah, you can. You can list other individuals who contributed to the document and should receive recognition. It's placed immediately below the roster. However, the acknowledgement cannot list specific contributions. And so what the TCM has is something that says special acknowledgements to, and you list the individuals, for their contributions to the sky. If the people are already listed in the roster, we're probably just going to put an asterisk by their name and just say, you know, special acknowledgement to these individuals who contributed for their contributions to this guide. Next, we're going to go into the format. I'm going to cover the format for a code, the format for specification, and the format for guides and reports. This is a very brief overview. I'm actually thinking after I put this together that I might try and have a couple webinars throughout the year where we talk about writing a code, writing a specification, writing guides and reports. But for today's purpose, all three docu or types of documents, your code specifications, guides, reports, have some front matter that is the same. And we would very much appreciate it if this is available when you send in your document for tag review. First being the title. Then we have our roster, which everyone knows what is on the roster now. Your synopsis, and that's a one or two paragraphs that kind of states the code scope and purpose. You don't need to go into much detail, or not the code, yeah, the code, spec, guide report. The synopsis is often used in Concrete International when we're announcing that your documents can become available for purchase. It's also used in the catalog. The keywords. 
These are significant topics covered by your document. A good place to look for those are your title, your synopsis, your table of contents. Limit it to about no more than 20 keywords and try not to have them be real general, like concrete. And then you'll also have your table of contents. And with your table of contents, you don't need to put in page numbers. We request that you don't use auto format for table of contents or section numbering. All the formatting gets done at publishing services. So when it comes in, we have to strip it out anyway. But when you do your table of contents, you only need to go one level deep, meaning you have chapter one and then 1.1, introduction, 1.2, scope. That's only as far as you need. You don't need to go 1.2, 0.3, 0.4, because we're just going to take that out anyway. So don't need to do that. Next is the format for codes. And if you have your TCM handy, it would be section 522. And actually, um, I'm looking at the 2014. Let me give you a page number. That would be in the 2013, it would be page 29. So um, there are three parts to the codes. You're going to have your general section, your notations and definitions, and then reference standards. After that, the remaining chapters uh, provide the requirements kind of in generally the order of design, construction, and inspection. So that's kind of the, the meat of your code comes after chapter three. Chapter one generally inclu includes your um, like scope, the purpose, the applicability, interpretation. Um, let's know it's um, they direct the design professional to include pertinent construction information in the contract documents. Talks about who has the adopting authority jurisdiction over an ACI code and clarifies it. And if you start to write a code, you've gotten TAC approval. There is the TAC Design Standards Committee, which is, has people on there who are experts in codes that can help you, and of course staff can as well. Notations and definitions are the next section. And obviously if a term is defined in the code, it, in the code section 2.1 of notation and definitions, or you put it in the, if a term is defined would go into the commentary, you know, it matches up in the code section. If it's defined in the code, it's in the code part of notations and definitions. If it's in the commentary, belongs in the commentary section. Units of measurement are given in the notation, so you can use those. And uh, chapter three is then your reference standards. And codes can only reference mandatory language standards or parts thereof. So. When you put them in, you'll have, um, we'll go over what that looks like later. If you have a code and you have commentary references, they go at the end of the document, just like any other um, guide or report. Next is where it gets a little more tricky. We're on to specifications, which are chapter six in your TCM. And if you are looking, what you might want to do is look on page 33 because we're going to start with the outline for a single item specification. And all of ACI's construction specifications are written in the three-part format um, according to the Construction Specifications Institute. Part one covers the general requirements, part two addresses products, and part three deals with the execution. So here's kind of a sample of a single technical subject Specification. So you're just dealing with one thing here. We have uh, your general, you'd have your scope, your interpretation, your definitions, reference standards, and then the minerals of these things are applicable. Chapter 2 again is your products, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and we'll go over how the reference standards are set up. And then you have part 3, your execution, and then as you move down further. Then your notes to specifier, general notes, forward to checklist, these are all in the TCM as well. Actually, this, these three items, the notes to specifier, general notes, and forward to checklist, you take the information verbatim out of the TCM. And you can find that information 
it is on page 36 of your TCM. You'll see the general notes. You put it in, and our copy says ACI specification XXX. You just drop in the number of your spec at this point. You have your forward to checklist, and then if you have any mandatory or optional requirements checklist, you can add them now. And also on page 36 and 37, we have examples of what those look like. And if you have checklist references, they are going to be in the same sort of commentary format as well as like codes or what they look like in um, guides and reports. Now, the multiple item specification, which is 301, is probably our most well-known multiple item specification, is pretty much the same as the single item, it's just you have more technical subjects. And so each technical subject is going to have its own subset, meaning if you're on page back to 33, we show a multiple item set. The section one, your general requirements, that's kind of it for the whole, the whole specification. But then when you go to your first section, your first item technical section, you're breaking it down again into general products and execution. And so all a multi-item spec is, is I kind of think of it as a single item spec, just done as many times as I need to for the number of technical items I'm discussing. So there's an in-depth example here. It goes to section three on and four on page 33. But I've just shown you part one, here's section two, and then if we had another section, it would be section three, and the same thing, general products execution. Section four, general products execution. When you get ready to write a specification, I would, if you haven't written one before, your committee, I would strongly suggest you get in touch with staff when you first start to lay it out, if, if this is not clear, and we can put you in touch with, or you can look up someone on the TAC Construction, or Construction Standards Committee, which used to be the SPEC Committee, or known as the SPEC Committee, and they know their specs inside out and be very happy to help you. And this is probably a good webinar to hold in the near future. And again, you end the same way as a single item spec, with your notes to the specifier, general notes, board a checklist, checklist references, and it's all very formulaic, and once you get familiar with it, you can see how it's laid out and follow along. Okay, the format for guides and reports, which is in Chapter 8 of your TCM, and if you want to start looking, you can kind of see where I'm, the outline is on page 43, and you start with your introduction in your scope. So chapter one is always introduction and scope. Chapter two is uh, notation and definitions, all the meat in between, and then you end with references. And if you had appendixes, that would be at the end. Your introduction and scope, uh, the introduction provides the synopsis of the document. Um, this is it. <clears throat> and kind of lets you know what's going on. The scope might go um, or a lot of times historical information is included in there. And then um, chapter two, notation and definitions. The same thing with your codes. You just kind of want to use notation that is used throughout the document or where people can go back and refer. Definitions, they're definitions that are kind of applicable to the document as a whole. And then everything that goes in between. And then your final chapter is your references. I did kind of want to clarify because introduction and scope in the 2013 TCM is a little vague. It's um, rewritten a little more here in 2014 to let you know that these two items provide the history of the document. And in, like I said, in that scope, you can also include um, a brief description of each chapter kind of to give us what this document does, and the introduction is more of a history as to why this document came about. Don't know if that helps clarify, but sometimes it's confusing between introduction and scope. And then your final chapter are your references, which leads us 
to the section on references. How you should format references and codes and specs are actually quite similar, well, the same. Um, a reference to a standard within a provision should include only its serial designation and not its title or date. So, for example, you would have laboratory tests shall be conducted in accordance with ASTM C330. Note, we don't have the date at the end of it, like dash 07 or dash 12. The only time you include that is if you have more than one ASTM 330. So, and you might have more than one for historical purposes. You're referring to one document for historical reasons and another one now is what you're using. In that case, you would want to put the year on so as not to confuse the reader. Codes continued then, so you've cited it in the text and now you have your chapter on how to cite the references. And I forgot to tell you that you are, if you're following along, that you would be on, back in Chapter 5. See, you're already learning that Chapter 5 has the uh, standard. You would go to page 29 and 30, kind of talks about the reference standards and how they're done. And uh, 31 has the references. So you get your Chapter 3 reference standards, and you just list them by organization, and then name, or the document identification, the year, and title. And that's how your Chapter 3 is set up. So it's American Concrete Institute, ASTM International, whatever would come after that just follows below. Your commentary references follow the same reference style as those um, as cited references and guides and reports. So I'll cover that when we hit guides and reports. In references, how you format or cite references and specifications is the same as it was in codes. So you're just saying ASTM C404, you're not using the year. Just like codes, if you had more than one of the same document, you would need to put the year in here. It's just a little different in their reference standard sections is that for specs, they kind of, they have this verbiage that says standards of, and you insert your abbreviation, cited in the specifications are listed by name and designation, including year. And back in your TCM, they are on page 38 under section 6.4. And what they do is they break down each organization with a number, so 141, 142, and so on. A little different than codes where there's no verbiage here and you don't have the numbers. Remember, our specifications are following the Construction Specifications Institute format. So that is why there's a little difference between the specs and the codes. It's not just to confuse you, I promise, or new editors when they come on staff. So the format and citing references and guides and reports are done in the author date format. We don't use numerical superscripts, and I actually don't believe I've seen any on any documents in a long time. Um, but here's an example of how you might cite something in the text. For example, um, you have something referring to ACI 228-1R at the end of the sentence, you just put it in. And there would be a period right here. And then if you have the author documents, if you have the author's names listed within the sentence, you just put the year of publication in parentheses. So refer to Hagelson and Henson, 1974. If your reference is contained and the author is not called out in the sentence, you just put it at the end, Grando et al. If you have three or more, I believe, you get the et al. And this is uh, detailed, again, in Chapter 8 of your TCM on page 46. Now, how it looks in the reference section is that you have this verbiage, which, again, is in the TCM in a boxed example. And then we break it down by the organization. So you have American Concrete Institute, ASTM International, ASCE, whoever else would be followed below. Once you've got the organizations listed first, and now you're moving on to author documents, we just have a heading that says author documents. You won't see that author documents in the 2013 TCM, but you will see it in the 2014 TCM. And then here's an example of what an author document looks like. 
and you can see we have the author's name, the year, title, location, page number. Please try and fill out as much of that information as possible that you know. Obviously, we need the authors and we need the year of publication. That's how we're going to cite it in the text. If you have the page numbers, that's very helpful. As much as you have is good so we can save time during the first pass and not query you with that later as to the references are incomplete. Okay, so as I had you flipping back and forth through the TCM here, <laughs> you probably started to notice that codes are in Chapter 5 of the TCM, specifications are covered in Chapter 6, guides and reports are in Chapter 8. Chapter 9 deals with the technical style of the TCM, so kind of how you set up equations, equation numbering, which now is by the provision or section. So if something is listed in section 2.3.5, it's equation 2.3.5. If there's more than one equation, it's 2.3.5a. And I will show you all this in just a minute in the TCM. A lot to, you know, retain. So tables, lists, general grammar things are listed in the ACI style. Notation and definitions is Chapter 10. Just kind of let you know um, some examples on what to do when you do definitions, you know, what makes for a good definition. Also, if let you know about the concrete terminology. An 11 is the units of measurement, which talks about like hard versus soft conversions. For the sake here, I'm going to show you the TCM real quick. We're going to go to the internet. Okay. Like I said, if you're on your committee's homepage, you scroll down, make sure you're logged in. You click on Technical Committee Manual. So we're in uh, Chapter 5 of the TCM, the format and language for codes. There's the organization I talked about. A little here's more in depth where you can see like Chapter 1, 2, 3, and then what we've called member chapters or the meat of your code, how it's set up. You see we have examples of the provision numbering, sort of the language, you know, that it's mandatory language. Uh, you know, so there's lots of things like that that you'll find in here. And then the reference sections, you know, preferred words or phrases. I don't expect you to know all this. It's, you know, a lot of the little things, um, you know, preferred words or phrases, staff editors will catch too. I mean, it's good to know this as well, but here it is for you. And then, you know, the commentary references for a code. So see Chapter 6, I have the single item and then the multi-item specifications. You kind of see how it's set up, the numbering within the specifications. Another um, important aspect of the specifications are some of the definitions that are important to the spec. So terms like not in the CT but important to the specifications should also be listed. These are some real common ones. Note which ones are capitalized and which ones are not. Again, that's according to the Construction Specification Institute. It goes in kind of explaining things more, so you kind of know that the setup of a specification. Here's the notes, the specifier that I was referring to. So you have your general notes. It's this information. You just copy and paste it. Granted, it's coming out of a PDF, so there'd be some formatting or retyping. Forward to checklist. And then, you know, we get more write-up so you see what's going on, your uh, examples of the checklist format sort of the language that's used in specifications. And then again, they have their reference standards. So you can see that and if there are any appendixes. And then chapter 8 is the format for guides and reports. And you can kind of see they're all set up the same way. They're talking about the title, the roster, the synopsis, um, numbering and titles of things, you know, how the sections are numbered, uh, some clarity. And so here we get into a lot of things of like the use of if, when, and where, acceptable and unacceptable terminology, and the reference section. It's very detailed in here because guides and reports are our most common documents we have. So you can see this is how it would look like, except now it says author documents right here. You'll also see we have examples, uh, cited references in the text. If you have one author, two authors, three or more authors, and then some examples down below. 
and then some more for like electronic resources, websites where you would find them. ACI does not include bibliographies in ACI committee documents. And then chapter nine, as I mentioned, again, is loaded with examples on how to cite things, numbering, figures, and this is all things that I think we could do a, another webinar on just on the details. <laughs> Chapter 10 is your notation and definitions. You know, we talk about the serial comma, some grammar. There's not a lot of grammar in here. That's, that's not what, you know, is uh, what we're expecting you to turn in, like, you know, from English professors. And then chapter 11, your units of measurement. This is a good page for you to know as well, because we also have the TCM as a PDF and as an EPUB. There's guides for writing a tech note, metric conversion guide, construction of symbols, a lot of balloting tools, which, and as you can see, we've actually had a webinar on balloting. How to um, examples, some forms, comment forms, checklists, your document submittal checklist when you submit something to uh, staff for tech review, responding to comments, responding to public discussion checklist. Uh, there's more information you can kind of scroll through here and see. And so this is a good web page to know as well. And this is where I'll list the webinars. Okay, so we have a question on uh, working to include dual units in a guide. Can you provide guidance on units for metric? There's, they should be, yes, the dual units, and you should follow Chapter 11 of the TCM. Yes, if you can look for those and follow the TCM for guidance. Um, it said, I think, that 318 didn't seem to follow 11.6.1 for commonly used values. Um, that one, we should be following 11.6.1 or this uh, guide to see, and that is the source that should be used. If you have um, a specific question, you can always contact staff, but as a general rule, I don't think you can go wrong with using 1161 as your guide or even that metric unit convention or uh, metrication conversion guide right here. I know sometimes it does get a little uh, messy sometimes between the hard and soft conversions, and that could be maybe part of the um, problem there. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, I think I saw a hand up. Yep. Uh, I have a que question about um, references. Uh, can you uh, include references that aren't cited in the text? Oh, oh excellent question. And no, you cannot. <laughs> um, we request that all the references in the reference section be cited in the text. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. That was an excellent question. Glad it was brought up. Okay, I'm scrolling looking for hands. Okay. Hi, Tess. Okay, hi, Shannon. Um, so I was the one that asked about the dual units on the guide, and maybe I just wanted to clarify a little bit. Um, so if you go to Chapter 11, there's Table 11.2 for the derived inch-pound units and Table 11.3 for the SI units. And oh, the okay. Question, and, then, and then there's 11.6.1 on commonly used values in the industry. So the question comes up as to are we sticking with the derived units or um, which in my case might be affected by um, stress, you know, Pascal, or if I look at 11.6.1, the conversions also indicate that megapascals is appropriate. And if you look at ACI 13, 318, the metric version, they use megapascals. So it's a little confusing on what part we should be using and how we, you know, do we have to stick only with pascals? Can we go to megapascals? That kind of stuff. Okay, so that's a good question. And, you know, one of the engineers might correct me, but I would think you would be okay to go ahead and use, like you said, the, as in 1161, and use some megapascals. I'm not sure, um, that is a really good question, why at some point, 
they would be more, I, I don't think this is just like the absolute list is, you know, set in stone 11.2 and 11.3. I think it's more appropriate to kind of look at using the other chart there in the conversion factors, and that allows you to have it, you know, the megapascals, as you said. If that is what, especially if your document, if that's common and that's how the industry would see it, I think that's kind of the goal is to make the document, you know, and the units of measurement so that it's what people see out, you know, what they're used to. I don't know if yeah, I'm saying that correctly, but, you know. That, yeah, Not that's to, like, great. Fit a guidebook that makes no sense when used, and you know, someone gets out there and says, "What is that unit of? You know, we don't use that unit of measurement. That or that we don't use that." I mean, I, I think it's the goal is to have it be user friendly. Yeah. Otherwise, and, we got a lot of ten to the sixes in there. So we'll work exactly. With that means nothing. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yep. Well, I thank you all for joining us today on our webinar. And again, if you have any questions later on, you think of them. Um, you have any suggestions on what you would like to see covered or, you know, future webinars. I hold these really, I mean, the whole purpose is to help the chairs and the officers do their job better. So if you just want to send me an email, I would be happy to take that into consideration and look and see what you know, can help you the most. My email address is Shannon, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N dot Banchero, B as in boy, A, N as in Nancy, C-H-E-R-O, at concrete.org. And my phone number, which I didn't put on there, is 248-848-3728. And like I said, I hope to have a couple more webinars this year where we'll specifically go over um, what's in a code, what's in a spec, and what's in a guide and report, kind of more of the meat of it, the details, I should say, because there's a lot there, and if we did that all in one hour, we would be overwhelmed. <laughs> so um, I thank you all, and have a good afternoon. <laughs>